The Ethics of Belief. Could it be wrong to believe on faith? William Clifford, William James on the Ethics of Believing Without Evidence. We've seen now that according to Pascal, we should believe in God, not because the evidence or arguments imply it, but because it's pragmatic. Pascal figures it's a good bet. For Pascal, in a situation where you have indecisive evidence, it's permissible for other reasons, pragmatic ones, to go ahead and believe. We can extrapolate that Pascal might even recommend belief when your evidence runs against it, if there's enough to be gained. And he thought heaven was a lot to gain, even if the odds are slim. Now we've got to consider Clifford, an English philosopher and mathematician from the 1800s. The positions we're considering are like this. When you're in a situation where your evidence on the whole is either inconclusive about some conclusion or even runs contrary to that conclusion overall, what is it permissible to believe? Is it okay to believe when it's not clear? Can we fault someone for believing in those cases? Is it wrong to do so? Clifford's answer is no. It is always wrong to believe on the basis of insufficient evidence. So we've got three positions we're considering now. We're going to fill in the second and third next. So what's okay when we, are in it, when we have inconclusive information? Pascal, of course, we've seen, says, well, God's unknown, but believing is a good bet. It might bring infinite reward, so we go ahead and believe. Clifford is going to argue that believing on the basis of insufficient evidence is always wrong for everyone, no matter how trivial the matter. And James is going to go the other route and say that believing despite inadequate evidence is permissible. It's even obligatory in some cases. So let's consider Clifford's argument. Ordinarily, moral judgments apply to what parts of our lives? Well, at least they apply to our actions. We have moral obligations to others. When we act, we affect the welfare of others. But what about beliefs or the ideas inside our head? We tend to think of those as a different category, and we may have some, we may have some more latitude or liberty about what we believe there. Uh, as a hint to what's going to come with Clifford, here's a quote from Muhammad Ali. It's the repetition of affirmations that leads to belief, and once that belief becomes a deep conviction, things begin to happen. Clifford's quite aware of the point that Muhammad Ali is making here, and he's going to use that, uh, an argument like that, to argue against believing when we don't have enough evidence. Clifford's point is that beliefs aren't isolated or atomic. They are part of a larger web, they are related to other beliefs, and they are inextricably tied to action. Consider some examples that he, he presents to illustrate his point. So Clifford's conclusion is going to be, no belief held by one man, however seemingly trivial the belief and however obscure the believer, is ever actually insignificant or without its effects on the fate of mankind. Every belief a person has becomes a ground for action, strengthens some conclusions, weakens others, prepares us to believe other things, and subsequently has a significant effect on our character. So Clifford's most famous example is the ship owner. The ship owner knows that a ship is not seaworthy. He's seen the evidence, but he convinces himself that the ship, the ship will make it one more journey. So he sends it off without telling the captain or crew about the threat, and it turns out that they all drown in a storm. Clifford concludes he's guilty of killing everyone on board, no matter how earnestly he believed or confident he made himself feel about its safety. Now it's quite clear in this case that the ship owner's failure to fulfill, fulfill his epistemic duty led directly to serious harm to the crew of the ship. Why does Clifford add the next point? Why does he say he's guilty no matter how earnestly or confident he made himself believe? Well, imagine that the ship owner afterwards said, but I genuinely believed that the ship would make it. I was completely sure that it was okay to send them to sea. Suppose the ship owner, like Pascal, had gotten himself to really believe it. Clifford's point is that powerful conviction alone isn't enough. This semester we've been operating with the principle that a reasonable person proportions the strength of her conviction to the quality and quantity of evidence. That is, you believe it only as assuredly as your evidence allows. If you have compelling evidence, then you should have a high degree of confidence in the conclusion. If your conclusion is only weakly indicated by the evidence, then 
you should believe it with proportionally less conviction. The problem, as we've seen with Pascal, and as you know by listening to one of your overzealous Oakland Raiders fans' friends, is that people are capable of having much more conviction about some matter than their evidence would warrant. Our confidence or conviction about some matter is often out of whack with the actual information we have about it. If we typically only believed a conclusion with as much confidence as the information allows, then if someone were to defend his decision with the claim, but I was totally sure that the ship was safe, then his earnestness and confidence could exonerate him. We'd know that if the evidence didn't warrant it, he wouldn't have believed it so assuredly. But we aren't like that, and Clifford knows we aren't, and Pascal has shown us how to separate the two. So Clifford's conclusion here is that you're feeling really sure you're believing something deeply in your heart is no excuse. That isn't enough by itself to justify your bad decision, especially given how warped and distorted and out of proportion our beliefs can become. S suppose the gamble had paid off and the ship owner arrived in the port safely. If the ship had not sunk, he would be no less guilty, says Clifford, for putting all of those people at risk with his belief. To believe that the ship is safe when it is not is immoral, period, says Clifford. And what Clifford's got in mind here is that the ship owner is just as guilty of killing of, uh, as if he had killed all those people, even if they hadn't come to disaster. And here's what Clifford's thinking about. We can calculate the risk of some bad outcome this way. Risk, according to decision theorists, is the probability that the event will happen multiplied by its seriousness. Having a butterfly land on your head today is highly unlikely and wouldn't have any serious consequences, so the risk is really low. But if your housemate is waving a loaded gun around with the safety off, the likelihood of its going off and shooting someone is pretty high and the consequences be very bad, so that's very risky activity. Clifford, to support his argument here, is focused on a case where the belief has a high risk associated with it. The ship owner decides to believe that the ship is safe and, and that, that if that was a, were a mistake it would have a disastrous outcome. So Clifford can motivate this really strong conclusion given those kinds of examples and say if the ship even if the ship hadn't sunk the ship owner would be no less guilty for putting all those people at risk with this belief so keep this in mind for for some objections and some other considerations we're going to have in a few minutes all right so clifford's conclusion then is that <coughs> therefore it's wrong to believe on insufficient evidence or to nourish belief by suppressing doubts and avoiding investigation what does that mean then for cases like faith? Well, let's consider some uh, examples, some religious and some not. So somebody might say a common usage of the term might be, I have faith in my girlfriend. I have faith that my husband will come home safely from Afghanistan. We must make a leap of faith in the dark hours. Why would God allow such a thing to happen to someone who is so innocent? The hospital chaplain might then say, well, we must have faith that God has a plan. I have faith that the 49ers will rebound in the last part of the game, and so on. So faith, if we can look at these examples, is a description of a way that people sometimes acquire their beliefs. So for S, a person, to believe P, some proposition by faith, means something like um, S believes P despite the fact that as S sees it, there is contrary evidence or inadequate evidence overall to make P justified. So S is in a ambiguous or indifferent or even contrary evidential situation about this matter but S goes ahead and believes it anyway. So what would Clifford say? Well predictably Clifford thinks that we shouldn't have faith. To have faith is to believe despite contrary evidence or inadequate evidence and Clifford says never believe on the basis of insufficient evidence. So how far does this obligation go? Are there any ever any cases where uh, it's okay to go ahead and believe despite insufficient evidence? And Clifford goes further to say, no one, however unimportant, is exempt from this requirement. Every bit of gossip, slander, malice, untruth uttered by one person has an effect on the rest of us.
You promote superstition, foster ignorance, encourage strife with falsehood, even if it's just you and somebody having a beer. So we can understand how Clifford would give his prohibition in cases where risk is high, but now Clifford's extending the prohibition to low-risk matters. No one is going to die if you spread a bit of gossip. The real concrete harm is minimal, and the likelihood of harm is pretty low. But beliefs can't be held in isolation from each other, says Clifford, and habits form, standards get lowered. Even trivial matters end up feeding into bigger issues. Small risks in increase the chances of bigger risks and harms. So Clifford's not going to make any exceptions. And in this case, Clifford thinks our moral duties impose epistemic duties, where epistemic have it has to do with knowledge or justification or believing. If the belief has been accepted on insufficient evidence, the pleasure is a stolen one, says Clifford. Not only does it deceive ourselves by giving us a sense of power, which we do not really possess, but it's sinful because it's stolen in, our, in defiance of our duty to mankind. And he's got a sense of the moral duty there of what, we, what harm we might do to them. It's wrong always, everywhere, and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. Doing so harms yourself and violates your moral duty to the rest of humankind. So Clifford's got a very conservative policy. He's worried, first and foremost, about making mistakes. His highest epistemic priority is, don't get it wrong. But what if somebody has different goals? Imagine a couple of different epistemic policies. One might be, a goal might be, to seek to maximize your true beliefs. But you might have a goal like Clifford's, do everything you can to avoid or prevent false beliefs. So even though nominally those look like they're similar, they actually have very different outcomes when we uh, pursue the two policies. For example, consider these two gambling policies. Imagine somebody's trying to maximize his wins at roulette versus somebody's trying to minimize their losses. Those two strategies are going to play out very differently and going to have very different outcomes. What if somebody's less worried about making mistakes, or more willing to make mistakes for the sake of getting it right more often? It might be that overall, the second strategy ends up having lower overall risks, or provides more overall benefits than the first. There are cost-benefit analyses that we should run concerning both approaches. Consider these two different gamblers. The first gambler, in order to win a lot, might need to spend $1,000. But in focusing on winning, being willing to put more money out there and face the risk of losing more, he actually ends up winning more often. So say he loses 800, but in the process he wins 1500 for a net gain of 700. The second gambler puts less money down, say only 100, minimizing his risks, and he manages to win 200 for a net gain of 100. Pretty clearly the first strategy pays off better, but only at a higher investment cost. And Clifford will point out that we're not talking about dollars, but in the case of the ship owner, people's lives. So let's consider what happens with these two different cases and what uh, analogies there might be between the different kinds of policies. These two players will proceed with various different strategies. So we've got either avoid mistakes, hesitate, don't jump, or chase truths, go ahead and make the leap. These two believers will have different approaches. Clifford is admonishing us to be reserved, to hold back, only lend assent when we've got solid information, otherwise suspend judgment or disbelieve. But if having the most true beliefs you could have was the goal, and getting some mistaken ones in there along the way wasn't a big deal, then you proceed very carefully. Okay, so all semester we've been considering these three possibilities that when you're confronted with some proposition, you can either believe it, you can suspend judgment about it, or you can disbelieve it. A reasonable person, we've been saying, will proportion the strength of her conviction to the quality and quantity of her evidence. So if you've got a lot of evidence in favor, then you'll strongly believe. If you have a lot of evidence against, then you'll strongly disbelieve. And if your evidence is dead split in the middle, then you're going to be most strongly inclined to suspend judgment. And as you move towards the other parts of the line, you're going to weaken your resolve to believe or weaken your resolve to disbelieve.
So suppose you've been searching all afternoon for a parking space and you can't find one anywhere on campus. You've checked all the lots. You've gone around and around over and over again. And you come to the conclusion on the basis of a lot of evidence that there's no parking spaces. Similarly, you have a lot of evidence leading you to strongly disbelieve that Miley Cyrus will be president someday. And we will be most committed to suspending judgment when our evidence is evenly split. Now let's consider these two different these two different epistemic policies between Smith and Jones. So consider Smith, who's very inclined to suspend judgment in lots of cases. It takes a lot to convince Smith to move over to believe something or to move over and cross the line to disbelieve. Smith is reluctant to lend assent. Smith most closely resembles somebody like Clifford who um, is going to be very conservative versus Jones who will believe more readily or disbelieve more readily and is less inclined to suspend judgment. So Jones is a decider. Jones makes decisions and moves off of the middle position. So here's a legitimate question. Where's the best place to put these dividers? Which one of these is the best policy to pursue? Should we be more like Smith where we're reluctant to sign on and accept some conclusion or we're um, reluctant to disbelieve until we get a lot of information or should we be more like Jones and be willing to stick our necks out there and go ahead and believe or disbelieve at perhaps a higher risk of getting it wrong? Another way of putting the question is, put in Clifford's terms, what constitutes insufficient evidence? Because what's insufficient for Jones is not insufficient for Smith and vice versa. Clifford doesn't really say, and we can imagine having legitimately different thresholds for the what constitutes sufficient to move us across the line. Statisticians and decision theorists say that when the probability is 50% or 0.5, we should suspend judgment. So imagine this this line representing um, our inclination to believe from zero at the far right to one at the far left, where suspending judgment is dead in the middle. And now we're wondering, okay, so what are what should our thresholds be for um, moving off of disbelieving and starting to suspend judgment versus going on to believe something? At what point in the accumulation of information should we go over the line to believing or disbelieving? That is, consider conservative versus liberal believing policies. Suppose Smith and Jones have exactly the same information that leans in favor of some claim X being true. Smith is inclined to only believe or disbelieve when a substantial amount of evidence has accumulated. Jones is inclined to believe or disbelieve more readily. So they both locate the probability of X exactly the same place, but Smith isn't ready to accept it yet. Smith want, is holding out for more information. So even though they have the same information, Smith will suspend judgment about X while Jones will believe it. The difference between these two isn't a difference in a matter of evidence. By hypothesis, we're considering two people who have exactly the same evidence. It's just Smith is more reluctant to believe than Jones is. So one question that Clifford doesn't really answer for us is, what constitutes insufficient evidence? He says we should never believe on the basis of insufficient evidence, but where does he put those thresholds that would lead us to accept, reject, um, or suspend judgment? And where we put those can have a really big difference, a big impact on our lives, as the example here with Smith and Jones shows. Okay, so which policy should we adopt can't really be settled by a policy. Both of them are following Clifford's dictum, never believe on the basis of insufficient evidence, but Jones and Smith have different attitudes about what constitutes sufficient. So how do we determine where those thresholds should lie? And I think the easy, the short answer here has got to be risk. That is, how risky a matter is it? How bad would it be to make a mistake in this case versus how good would it be to get it right um, even though we don't have absolutely compelling evidence? Clifford is going to point to cases like the ship owner where being too liberal is deadly. So he's going to point to these high risk examples. But consider some other easier cases. Imagine somebody who's wondering, well, will I like the IPA or will I like the lager more? Trying to make that decision. Versus, should I treat my cancer with chemotherapy and radiation or try meditation, diet, and yoga? <laughs> 
And what I've got in mind here is the Steve Jobs case, where Steve Jobs actually had uh, cancer, and they found the cancer early on. And rather than go with chemotherapy and radiation, Jobs tried to do meditation, diet, yoga, and Buddhist practices, um, and ultimately to his demise. Okay, so deciding which one of these policies is going to depend on the circumstances. And the problem is that Clifford has shown us uh, only these, worst, these sorts of worst case scenarios. Suppose Jones is a stockbroker and he too readily believes in trends and then sells his stock too quickly. He's going to lose more over time. If Smith is a doctor and she's reluctant to jump to conclusions without more information, she might save lives. We don't want our doctors to be hasty or easily swayed. So the situation, the circumstances, the consequences, the benefits, the awards, rewards, those all make the big difference about which one of these two policies we ought to adopt. And I'm suggesting that Clifford has overstated the case by starting with these really disastrous cases and then moving on and exaggerating some of the other harms associated with some of the lesser matters. Are there cases then, we can ask this question, where there are harms or losses from being too stingy like Clifford? Will that get us into trouble? Will being like Clifford cause us some harm? Because after all, Clifford's worried about harms. William James importantly offers a famous rebuttal. James says, yes, th that great harm can come to us by being too stingy and too reluctant to sign on for something the way Clifford has suggested. So let's consider some of those examples. The question then is, when is it OK to go beyond the evidence? And a technical way to put these positions is this. For a person S, a proposition P and evidence E, Clifford's principle seems to be something like this. S should believe P if and only if S's evidence supports P. Belief in cases where S's evidence is split or runs contrary to P is impermissible, so it's not okay to believe in any other cases. But now we can think of some examples like this. If your odds of surviving a deadly illness were only 5%, but research had shown that a positive outlook and believing that you will survive improves your odds to 15%. You'd have a significant pragmatic justification for believing, but the evidence would still suggest otherwise. That is, 85% of people with this particular illness die, only 15% survive, but 15 is better than 5. So even though your evidence is resoundingly against your survival, pretty clearly you ought to believe by not believing in this case, you do yourself a great harm. So this is intended to be a counterexample to Clifford. Clifford says it's never permissible to believe on the basis of insufficient evidence, but here's a Pascal type of case where pragmatically you stand to gain a great deal. On Clifford's principle, you shouldn't believe, and I suppose you should just accept that you've now only got a 5% chance of surviving. So the point of the example is that different kinds of mistakes have different levels of disutility, and Clifford seems to have run them all together. James's principle, who we're about to discover, about to discuss, is this: S should believe P if S is E if S's evidence supports P on the whole. So James is fine with believing something that your evidence supports, but James is also going to be perm uh, permissive about believing in case where your evidence is split or maybe even contrary. It's permissible. Uh, it's okay to go ahead and believe. All right, so uh, what are the major points of William James's critique of Clifford? Well, for first off, uh, William James is what's known as a doxastic involuntarist. That's to say, he doesn't think we have the sort of voluntary control over what we believe that Clifford seems to assume. It's not entirely under your free-willed control to change your mind so easily or readily. So we hear people say things like, it's a free country, I can believe what I want, but a doxastic involuntarist is going to say, well, actually, you can't. Try believing that 2 plus 2 equals 5, or that there is a human colony on Mars right now. You can't just will yourself to believe these things. So our belief states are actually something that, um, that we find ourselves with. We discover that we believe certain things, but the process of change um, uh, the alteration is uh, is not the this sort of deliberate willed event that Clifford would suggest, and James is going to argue that famously ought implies can. That is, if you don't have free control over your beliefs, then it doesn't make 
as much sense to be like Clifford and hold somebody morally responsible for what they believe, um, they can't really help it is a way of thinking about it. Now, I don't overstate the point. James does think that you're responsible um, for what you believe, but um, uh, James has got a, a slightly different attitude about uh, the responsibility here and about um, about our uh, willfully controlling what it is we believe and James is going to cut people slack for believing finding themselves believing even though they may have insufficient evidence okay so uh, what James argues is that some situations in our lives present us with live forced and momentous choices okay so that requires us to lay out some various distinctions first off Let's consider live versus dead options. Live options are choices between possibilities that are plausible or real to you. They offer choices that are near to what you already believe or that have some appeal, such as, this makes sense to you, be a Republican or a Democrat. Now, you may be profoundly opposed to being a Democrat. You might be a Republican, but being a Democrat in that case is a closer, a nearer by option than some other more bizarre option, like a dead option that's a choice that's distant and plausible or unappealing. So imagine the choice between being an anarcho syndicalist or a federalist. Neither one of those seem live or plausible or even in the neighborhood for you. You're closer to being a Democrat than you are to being an anarcho syndicalist. So those are dead options. So believing in God is a live option for uh, humanity. It's something that's very real, it's very poignant, it's, it's nearby. Or another, consider another dead option, be an atheist or a secular humanist is, for most people, um, at least most Americans, neither one of those is really on the map as possibilities. Okay, now what about the other options? Forced options are options that offer no other alternatives. They cover all of the possibilities. So here's one. X is a human or it's not. Everything in the universe fits into one or the other of those two, two categories. And as we've seen, belief, belief in God or lack of belief in God covers everybody. Everybody either believes or they lack a belief because agnostics and atheists both lack a belief. So those two options cover everything that makes them forced. And that's different than, say, um, uh, believe that there is a God or deny that there is a God. Well, atheists deny that there's a God, but agnostics are in between. So the second option is forced. The one in the parentheses is not. And finally, momentous options are choices that matter. They're rare, they're unique, they're significant. So here's one. Do you want to go to Justin Bieber's private, Bieber's private Christmas party as his date or not? Do you want to visit the White House and join the president for dinner? Now, however much you might hate Justin Bieber, uh, it'd still be a momentous event. It would be rare, it would be unique, it'd be significant, it'd be memorable. And certainly that would be the case about going to the president, going to have dinner with the president. So obviously the God decision is a momentous decision in our lives. It's a big deal. It makes a big difference to what we, what happens in our lives, the way we live, the way we think. So James argues that religion presents us all with a lived, forced, and momentous choice. Have a belief in God or don't. And James argues that our passional nature not only lawfully may, but must decide an option between propositions whenever it is a genuine option that cannot by its nature be decided on intellectual grounds. We're driven by our passions, by our emotions, and this is the doxastic involuntarism in, Jay, in James, that our emotive systems drive us to believe something here. It's not something we can leave alone. Clifford's conservative policy could be acceptable in cases where the choice is dead, unforced, or trivial. So imagine somebody says, I will suspend judgment until I listen to Katy Perry's album a few more times. Or somebody thinks, uh, by contrast, do I go with Dr. Ableton's treatment of my cancer or with Dr. Reed's treatment of my cancer? That choice is not dead, it's not um, unforced, and it's not trivial. It's a big deal. It matters. You can't leave that lie, and you can't be conservative like Clifford when you're in that kind of situation. If it's live, forced, and momentous, you can't hold back. You can't set those thresholds for believing or disbelieving way out there at those, at those ultra-conservative limits.
So let's what's what we're describing here is what's known as James's pragmatism. The adoption of an epistemic policy, such as never believe without sufficient evidence, is itself passionately motivated. Okay, so James is getting to the heart of what's going on here. He thinks that Clifford cares about making a mistake and possibly hurting others, and he's absolutely right. It's caring about harms to others or oneself that motivates you to care about reasons and motivates James, uh, Clifford to want to be uh, conservative. And it's only passions ultimately that make us care about the truth or about the harms. Sometimes we have to believe on insufficient grounds, moral dilemmas, personal relationships, and spiritual matters. It's unavoidable. Sometimes we have to make the leap. Believing before or without proof in the case of God provides us with a vital good in our lives. James's point is that all beliefs are ultimately motivated by our passions, and that seems to suggest a kind of, well, all of the other kids are doing it approach. Since all beliefs are driven by our passions, it's okay for our religious beliefs to be driven by them too. So part of what's come out here is um, a set of distinctions that we can borrow from ethics. Uh, in ethics, we know about these categories of moral behavior. So consider an act is often permissible when it's morally neutral, when doing it is neither right nor wrong, neither forbidden or required. It's just a, an action that doesn't matter, it won't do any harm, it won't do any good. So putting butter on your toast instead of jelly is permissible. An act is forbidden when you violate a duty by doing it. So you have a duty to respect other people's freedom, so enslaving somebody is morally wrong, it's forbidden. So those are actions that we cannot, we should not, we ought not do, versus acts that are permissible to do. We could, we could do them or we could not do them. And then finally there's acts that are obligatory. These are ones that you can't refrain from doing. To refrain would be to do something wrong, you must do it. So feeding and clothing your children is obligatory, obligatory which is different than merely permissible. So now, what about the relevance of this threefold distinction from ethics over to the question of God and believing with your evidence? Is it okay to believe in God when your evidence is unclear? And now we've seen all three different positions and seen arguments for all three positions. Pascal, of course, thought it was permissible to go ahead and believe, even though your evidence was unclear, because you stand to possibly gain. Clifford has argued that it's forbidden to believe when your evidence is unclear, and James has argued that it's obligatory, that we can't help but believe you're uh, forgiven for believing, you ought to believe, you, um, uh, you should believe. Okay, so in conclusion, we've got Clifford argues that it's always wrong to believe on the basis of insufficient evidence. He pursues a conservative epistemic policy that favors suspending judgment over believing or disbelieving. He has a very low tolerance for risk at the cost of losing out on possible benefits. James, on the other side, argues that there are many cases where the conservative policy loses. He's a doxastic involuntarist. And he argues that we can't follow Clifford when the decision is live, forced, and momentous.